My Country Tis of Thee, America the Beautiful, an Air Force song, and then uh, Cason's Go Army song, Cason's Go Rolling Along, and then the Navy song, Anchors Away, and then the Marine Corps song. We can't do that because we don't have a gene out there hymnal. <laughs> <laughs> I bet you did, yeah, yeah, had a lot of fun. Turn, if you will, to the book of Acts. Sixteenth chapter, sixteenth chapter back. I was telling Ted this morning, I, I'm having trouble with him leading the singing. I have trouble with Ted leading the singing because I get so engrossed to hearing him sing, I forget to sing. You know, I'll just sit there and listen to him, you know, because it sounds like Jim Reeves, you know, and he sings too good, and then I forget to sing, and I don't want to mess it up. Dan had a good idea a while ago. Huh? I know it. He's already puffed. <laughs> <laughs> he was puffed up when I first met him. Dan, yeah, Dan had a real good idea a while ago, and it's something we we're going to do for the church, and I need to talk to Rance right over after it's over. Yeah, T-shirts for the church. And the T-shirt says, how am I living? And then it gives my phone number. See? <laughs> <laughs> then if you're not living right, well, they call the preacher, see. You know, I really hope they don't do that because I hear enough garbage. I'm depressed. I tell my wife last night, I get so depressed. Yes. Do you have call waiting? <laughs> <laughs> I'll need it, won't I? I'll need call waiting. Yeah, I'll need call waiting. Call yeah. Call, yeah. <laughs> call blocker. Yeah. Call blocker, yeah. We'll need assistant pastor probably to take the call. But I thought that was cute. I heard of an, another T-shirt the other day. I don't remember who's telling me about this. It was real cute on the back of it. It said, I've gone to see Dad. Oh, you're wearing it. Well, where does it say that? Oh, it's a little bit, isn't it? It's a cross. It says, gone to see Dad. We're fixing a place for you. Be back soon to pick you up. Isn't that cute? Now, turn it around and show them. It's the cross. Uh, okay. Well, I didn't know. I had never seen one. I just heard about it, but I think that's great. I just, I think that's great. There it is there. I can't go more. It's on the front of the church. It's a church that I have a hard time remembering names. I said, I do too. I told him I did too. He said, oh, oh, okay. All right, okay. Yeah, I do. I have a hard time. I have a hard time remembering anything. I think what I hate to tell this on myself, but since it's Fourth of July, I guess I will. Not that that has to do with anything. We got out of the car a while ago, and we walked up and was talking to Chubby, and Susan's standing there, and I said, "Oh man, I forgot my glasses." And Chubby said, "Which ones?" And then I looked, and I thought, "Oh, I got them on," because <laughs> I felt my shirt pocket. And I usually I carry them in my shirt pocket till I get inside. And I said, "Oh man, I forgot my glasses. I thought I'm going to drive all the way home." And he said, "Well, which ones?" Now. I said, oh, it's my Bible. So, uh, you know, I went and got my Bible out of the car. I forgot my Bible, too, and I thought I forgot my glasses. It's really, it's tough when you get old. It is bad. I can't hardly wait till I get 60. You know, man. The 16th chapter of the book of Acts. The 16th chapter of the book of Acts. But, you know, there's one consolation. I'm not by myself, folks. Yeah, but not in that. A lot of you people don't have very good memory. I know that. For sure. So there. I can't remember who, but some of you don't have a <laughs> You can't hear me, did you say? Maybe my hearing's going too. I don't know. Or right, what did she say about my hearing? Oh, he can't hear either. Nah. I can hear, I just can't distinguish what they said. You know, I guess that's my problem. I'm going to move this back down then, I guess, if you can hear me all right. The 16th chapter of Acts, we find here in the 15th chapter that uh, Paul and Barnabas had a falling out because they were going to make another missionary gen uh, journey and, and go back through the cities where they had established churches. And so 
uh, Barnabas wanted to take his nephew, Mark, and Paul didn't want to, and they really got into a discussion about it, and they really had a falling out about that. And so Barnabas, great man, great man of love, and, and you know, really, in this case, Barnabas was right. You know, a lot of times we, we judge the youth too strongly. You know, uh, since Mark had failed on the first, gen first journey, missionary journey, and went back, he got scared or whatever, but he left them and went back home. Well, Paul didn't want to take him anymore. But Barnabas wanted to give him another chance, and he did. And we know that Mark turned out to be a, a great, a great man. And so Barnabas took Mark and went into Antioch, and, and now right there is where Barnabas sails off the pages. We don't know, we don't hear any more about Barnabas, but history tells us that he had a great ministry and there in Antioch and a lot of people were saved. But so Paul took Silas and look at verse 40, it says, Paul chose Silas and departed, being recommended by the brethren into the grace of God. In other words, the church was with him in it. They agreed. And he went through Syria and Silica, confirming the churches. Then came he to Derby and Lystria. Now, how many remember what happened there at Derby and Lystria? Lystra. Do you remember? Well, do you remember when Paul and Barnabas came in, the, in there, they healed the, the impudent man? And they said, oh, they're gods. And so they were going to uh, worship them as gods, you remember? And they said, no, don't do it. We're just men like you are. And, and so they uh, stoned Paul, thought he was dead anyway, whether he was or not, threw him out of the city, and he revived God, revived him. Well, they went back through there, and that's where they're going. And it says, and behold, a certain disciple was there named Timothy." So their first missionary journey did bear some fruit. There was a young disciple there named Timothus, Timothus, well, or Timothy. That's who he's talking about. The son of a certain woman which was a Jewess and believed, but his father was a Greek. And referring to Timothy, says, which was well reported of by the brethren that were at Lystra and Iconium. Him would Paul have to go forth with him and took him and circumcised him because of the Jews which were in, all, in those quarters. For they knew all that his father was a Greek. Now, doesn't that seem strange that he would do that? Does that seem strange that he would do that? Because do you remember in chapter 15 where they had, had the council and the whole thing was about where the, does, do the Gentiles need to be circumcised to be saved? And they come to the conclusion, no. So why would Paul do that? But we find out that Paul would do that in one instance but not do it in another instance. Now, turn to the book of Galatians. And we find out why. Now, if you look in the second chapter of Galatians, he says, Then 14 years after I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and took Titus with me also. And I went up by revelation and communicated unto them that gospel which I preached among the Gentiles, but privately to them which were of reputation, lest by any means I should run or had run in vain. But, but, but neither Titus who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. And that because of false brethren, unawares, brought in, who came in privately to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage. To whom we gave place by subjection, no, not for an hour, that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. So see, when uh, concerning Titus, the legalizers came in and said, you need to circumcise him. He said, no, in order to be saved. He said, no, I won't do it. So... Titus was a Gentile, Timothy was Gentile and, and half Jew. Now, in the one case of Timothy, he allowed him to be circumcised because he didn't want that to be a stumbling block. But in the case of Titus, they said he must be circumcised in order to be saved. He said, no. And so he would not bow to that whatsoever. Now, let me give you an illustration of the way we did it today. Now, in Baptist churches, or here's the Baptist faith. Not all Baptist churches do that. 
when someone comes from another faith, we baptize them into our fellowship. And there's nothing wrong with that. But don't you ever, if you leave this church and join another church, don't you ever let them rebaptize you, or if I tell you you need to be rebaptized because you're not saved unless we baptize you, then don't do it. See, it's why is it done? If it's just a matter of being baptized in our fellowship, that's one thing. We're not saying you're not saved. We're not saying your baptism wasn't any good. But we just baptize into our fellowship. But if we try to tell you, unless we baptize you, you're not saved, see, well, then you're going against the gospel. And you stand on that. And that's exactly what happened. In the case of Titus, they said, the legalizer said, well, look, hey, he's not circumcised. He's not saved. And so Paul said, we didn't give way to him, not for an hour. We stood our ground. Why? Because the gospel was at stake, see. If they'd give in, well, then they'd have lost ground. But in the case here of Timothy, it's just a matter of not wanting to be uh, cause an offense or stumbling block to, because Jews were in that quarter. Where they were going, there were Jews, and they didn't want the issue to come up. It wasn't a matter of salvation. It was just a matter of whether it was a stumbling block or not. You see, there's a lot of things. Paul says, I've become all things to all men, but by, so that by some means I can win, win some, see. And Paul was willing to do a lot of things in order to win souls, but he would not compromise the gospel. He contended for the faith, as we were talking about this morning. Now, Titus was Gentile. Timothy was Gentile and Greek. I mean, was Jew and Greek or Gentile. And as they went through the cities, they delivered them the decrees for to keep that were ordained of the apostles and elders which were at Jerusalem. Now, what were these decrees? What does it mean they delivered the decrees? From the elders, apostles and elders at Jerusalem. Uh, this is just kind of like a... Uh, a test because we had this last week what, what do you suppose he's talking about we delivered these decrees that the apostles and the elders at Jerusalem had set forth huh yes yes the, 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 what the council had decided on that we lay no unnecessary burden on you other than abstain from blood abstain from things strangled and abstain from fornication so they went through all back around confirming the churches, it says here. And so were the churches established in the faith and increased in number. Now, this is strange. This is weird, folks, because this doesn't normally happen in our day. Daily. The churches increased daily. Well, how would they increase daily? What do they mean, increase daily? Does that mean they had... Sunday morning service every day? How did they increase daily? Let me, let me rephrase this. Was the church taught something that's not being taught today? Yes. Do you know what the church was taught? Now, this is going to shock you. you know what the church was actually taught? The first church was actually taught? That you're supposed to win souls. Isn't that something? That's unheard of today. The church is to do the ministry. You're to win souls. The preacher's job is to feed and teach and strengthen the church so they can do the work of the ministry. But here's what happened. Did you know that's the reason the church grew by leaps and bounds? Everybody was preachers. Everybody thought it was their job to witness. And share the gospel. And so that's what they were doing. But I, I, I wish I'd have studied this. Uh, it's been too long since I studied. But there was a period of time when there was a king or a ruler that was sympathetic to the Christians. And so he decreed that everybody in the nation must be a Christian. He said, everybody in this kingdom must be a Christian. So here's what happened. All the heathens were forced to join the church they didn't know nothing about winning souls. They were lost as a goose theirself. And so it finally got to the point where the church said, man, this is total confusion. Here, here we got a whole church full of people that aren't even converted, so preacher, you do it. 
you're really the only one that knows the gospel. The rest of them don't know it. They're all confused. They don't know what they're supposed to do, so let the preacher do it. And that's the way we do today. It's the preacher's job. Bring them to church and hope they get saved. But don't witness to them on the job. Don't witness to your next-door neighbor. Don't witness to your friends. But see, the early church did that. that. They didn't know any better. That was their job. That was what they were called to do. That's what they were saved to do, was to witness. Go into all the world and preach the gospel. And so that's what they did. And it says that the, the church grew daily. It grew daily. People were being converted daily. And I'll tell you, that's an exciting thing when that happens in a church. That's an exciting thing. I, I remember at Liberty and even at Alpine, during the week, just about every week, there'd be three or four or five people saved during the week. And it was always exciting to come to church Sunday just to see who the new Christians were. They didn't know any better. See, now, now, when I started there at, at Alpine, I started with, with a whole community that people were lost, maybe with the exception of a couple of people. Well, that's what I told them they're supposed to do. I said, you're supposed to witness. You're supposed to win souls. Well, they didn't know any better, and that's what they were doing. And so every week, we was having four or five people saved. I mean, to come to church, plus what was saved on Sunday. And God really blessed. And, and I'll tell you what, we was, we'd have baptisms out the lake, and there might be 25 or 30 people. Just every once in a while was being baptized. So the church was growing daily. I, I'm really encouraged by this, uh, uh, this class that Jason's getting ready to teach. And if you, you know, it was announced this morning. If you're interested, and if you want to know how to win souls to Christ, then take this course. But don't take it unless you're serious because it's going to take some work on your part. You're going to have to memorize some scriptures. Because one thing you don't want to do is to open up a conversation with somebody about their soul, and then you don't know what to tell them. You don't know the scriptures. You don't know where to find it in the Bible. You don't know what to say. But if you want to be a soul winner, then you come and you take this class. But it's going to take some commitment. And don't join it if you're not committed. And now, now how, what did you say it was going to take? Uh, in, in the way of time. As far as daily, it's going to be about an hour. That don't mean you meet here for an hour, but that means a memory work. Memory work on your own. And about how long will it take, the course? That's 16 weeks. 16 weeks? 16 weeks. So we're going to meet uh, this Thursday at 7. And yes. Uh, Okay, then you can make the decision whether you want to do it or not. So we'll be down here Thursday at 7. Okay, but so it, it, we're just asking you to do what God tells us to do anyway. So they established the churches, and the church increased in number daily. Now, when they had gone through Parga and the region of Galatia, and were forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia. All right, now, let's show you something here. Paul wanted to go into Asia. Now, you remember the seven churches of Asia Minor? Does anybody remember anything about the seven churches of Asia Minor? Where are they found? Do you know where they're found? Revelation. Revelation, Revelation speaks of the seven churches of Asia Minor. All right, now, but the, he wanted to go into Asia. But at this point in time... The Lord said no. Now keep in mind, the Lord is running the church. Now the Lord said go into all the world and preach the gospel, but still we're under the direction of the Lord where and when we go. So Paul wanted to go into Asia, and the Holy Spirit said no. You're not going to Asia. So look what he said. They were forbidden of the Holy Spirit Ghost to preach the word in Asia. After they were come to Mysa, they essayed to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit suffered them not. They started to go north into Asian Minor. The Holy Spirit said no. So Paul started to go another direction. The Holy Spirit said no. Listen, it's imperative that we follow the leadership of the Holy Spirit. Now let me tell you something that, that the Southern Baptists do, and I'm not faulting them for it. I'm not saying it isn't a good plan. I'm not saying it isn't a good thing, but I will say this, this has never worked for me. 
Now, they, they would have you do this, and there's nothing wrong with it, and I'm not against anybody doing it. I'm just saying this never has worked for me, where they just start down the street knocking doors. Now, I've done that, and it has never worked for me. What has always worked for me is when I pray, Lord, you remember the little song, Lead Me to Some Soul Today? Teach me, Lord, just what to say. Yes. Isn't that great? That's great. Right, but I'll show you how the Holy Spirit leads. Now, the Holy Spirit wants the gospel to go out to everybody, but sometimes it's like, not yet. Go here first. See, the Holy Spirit has to work with people's hearts, and, and he does that a lot of times by circumstances coming in their life. And, and there's something happened in my life I guess I'll never forget. I, back when I was in the meat business, there was a man over in Tulsa had a place called Jim's Coney Island. And Jim sold out, I sold Jim meat for a long time. He was a Greek, his name was Jim Bokadakis. And he sold the place to a man by the name of Stacy. Now, early in the morning, I would take 90 pounds of meat over there, and it would be early, like 7 o'clock in the morning, and, and, and 7 o'clock in the morning, that was a madhouse there. Because they were standing at the door waiting for the meat, and as soon as I got the meat, they had to get it on and cook the chill in. And uh, you couldn't talk to them. But this Stacy, I remember he just cussed like a sailor. I mean, you know, you just, man, it's blah, 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 you know, just rip it off. Well, I'd just be in there, I'd leave the meat, he'd pay me, and I'd leave. Well, one day I was at the store, and the Lord just said, you need to go talk to Jim. So this was like 2 o'clock, and I knew the rush was over. I knew they wouldn't be busy. I got in the car, I went to Tulsa, and I remember I, I walked in the back door, because I always came in the back door. He was sitting up front at a table reading a paper. Well, I, I walked up to him, he looked up and saw me and said, well, what are you doing here? And I sat down and I said, I come to talk to you about your soul. And he closed the newspaper, folded up, put his elbows up on the table and said, I need it, let's have it. But, but now, here, now to show you how the Holy Spirit leads. So I told him how he could be saved, gave him the gospel, and I said, Jim, we can go right back here in the kitchen right now and you can get down on your knees and be saved. He said, let's go. And we got up and we started to go to the kitchen and I didn't even know it, but there was another man sitting at a table behind us. And he said, sir, and I turned around and said, yes. He said, can I go too? He was listening while I was preaching to Jim. Now that's the Holy Spirit, see. Another time, it might not have worked at all. I might have went another day, and he wouldn't have been ready for it. He wouldn't have been receptive to it. So all I'm saying is, prepare. Learn how to win souls. But then ask God to lead you to somebody. And let me tell you why. Because God knows who's ready. Did you know that? God knows who's ready. And all he's looking for is someone that he can send that's ready. You see, they have to be ready, and you have to be ready.
It wouldn't do any good if you go and you don't know what to say. But anyway, Paul wanted to go in Asia Minor, and he couldn't go. He wanted to go in the other direction. He couldn't go. The Holy Spirit said no. Why? Because the Holy Spirit had another place already prepared. Now, let's go on. Golly, I thought I was going to get that whole chapter. Uh, look what happened. And they passing through Mysa came down to Troas. And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. There stood a man of Macedonia and prayed him, saying, Come over unto Macedonia and help us. How many re remember the song, Send the Light? Do you remember the song? Where's the song book? The writer of the song uses this. Look, th there's a call comes ringing over the restless waves. Send the light. Send the light. There are souls to rescue. There are souls to save. Send the light. Send the light. Verse 2. We have heard the Macedonian call today. Send the light. Send the light. And a golden offering at the cross we lay. Send the light. Send the light. And I want to tell you something, and I'll close with this. If we will prepare if we really want to win souls, I guarantee you, you'll get a Macedonian call. You get serious about it, and I dare you to pray in the morning, Lord, send me somebody to witness to. Send me somebody to witness to. If you're serious about it, he'll do it. You'll get that Macedonian call. He'll put somebody on your heart. But when he does, be prepared. Know what to say. Have your verses memorized. Know how to lead somebody to the Lord. You know, but we, we make it some, so hard. And, and, you know, I think what happens to, to the laity is they think they've got to be theologians to lead somebody to the Lord. And here's the reason, here's the reason they think that is because so many times whoever they're witnessing to will get them chasing rabbits. They get well, now, Brother Dan's shaking his head because he witnesses all the time. And I like now this is second hand because I believe it was Jason was telling me. Dan will go into like a Bowdens or something. He'll pray and he'll go into a Bowdens or wherever. And he says, Lord, now if I go in, there's nobody in there. I know you want me to witness to him. He's always looking for that opportunity. Dan, just take a minute. What's some of your success? Now he just keep in mind, he just been saved five years, so he don't know yet. He don't know you're not supposed to do this. <laughs> Tell us some of your experience of, of just witnessing to people. Well, that's uh, basically it. I don't know if you know you can't do that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, uh, but every time we get in my vehicle, thank God, I always pray for the Lord to get to where I'm going and to provide an opportunity to witness. Uh-huh. Yes. Well, if I go into a place, there's no one there. I say, thank you, Lord. And uh, I would ask people, uh, different ways you started. Uh, some of them, do you go to church? Some of them, are you a Christian? One of them told me yes. I said, well, are you saved? He said, well, thank you, Lord. I said, no. <laughs> they didn't know the difference, see. I said, Lord, what do I do now? Yeah. Yeah. I can't do no, that's right. Yeah. And it's it's a uh, it's a great feeling. Yes, it is. And uh, but one story. Uh, the Lord used me to lead this one young lady to the Lord, and I didn't see her. No more. She was down in the store. Well, the Lord keeps a string between. Three years later. idea 
Yeah. 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 And I praise the Lord for it. Yes. And I'm not a ball of fire, you know. I'm not a hyper person. Yeah. Don't think I'm anything spectacular. Yeah. Follow the leading of the Holy Spirit and look for the opportunity. Yeah. Just think what would happen if all of us would witness. Just think what would happen if every one of us in the morning and mean it, say, Lord, lead me to somebody. Lead me to somebody that's ready, that you've been working with, or that I can just plant the seed. And I've noticed a lot of times that's all you do is just plant a seed. The Apostle Paul says, Paul is a plant, I'll water. But God gives the increase. And never forget that. God does the saving. You don't do the saving. But you might walk in and plant the seed. Somebody else comes along saying, Lord, lead me to some soul. And they reap. And I'm going to tell you right now, it's a lot more fun to reap than it is to plant. But nevertheless, it's all necessary. Yes? Uh, one thing I do also, if I start and somebody walks in, I just yes. like yes. the Lord wasn't with me. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Or he would have kept that person away. Yes. Yes. There used to be a man, I'll close with this one, I promise you. There used to be a man that got, went to our family, went to our church, and uh, a boy, a man. And their dad was an atheist, and they wanted me to go witness to him. And I went by, and I bested with him, and I didn't get anywhere with him. You know, he just, no, I don't believe in God. And he was an elderly man. He didn't believe in God. Well, one night I was just out visiting, wanting, Lord, where do you want me to go? And, and I just had him on my heart. Well, I went by and I knocked on the door, and, and the lady that he was living with answered the door, and I said, I come to see this man. She said, well, uh, he's not here. He said, he's in the hospital. And I said, well, anything serious? She said, no, just physical. said, he goes in once a year and gets a physical. But he was, because he was probably around 80, said he just goes in to get a physical. I said, well, tell him I'll be back. This was like on a Saturday night. I said, tell him be back. I'll be back the first part of the week. Well, I went and got in the car, and as soon as I got in the car, something said, no, you go see him tonight. So I went back, and I said, what hospital is he in? And she told me. said, osteopathic hospital, and told me the room. Well, I went in. When I got off the, opera, the, the elevator, her daughter was in the hall, and, and she said, oh, I've been praying that you'd come. She said, who called you? And I said, well, nobody called me. I said, I just went by to see him, and and he wasn't home, and, and that's the only second time I'd have been by. It had been a year since I'd been to see him, somewhere around a year. So I walked in there, and I started talking to him about the Lord, and he said, well, you know what? I've just been thinking. When I get out of here, I said, I think I'm going to start coming to your little church. And I said, we'd love to have you, but I said, you need to be saved right now. And he said, I know I do. And I said, well, I'm going to pray. And while I pray, why don't you just ask God to forgive you for your sins and to come into your heart and save you? And he said, okay. And so I prayed. And then when I got through, boy, his face was just lit up. And I said, did you? And he said, I sure did. And as I was walking out the door, I heard him tell his daughter, I should have done this years ago. Well, next morning we had church. I mean, it was Sunday school, time for church and Sunday school. The daughter and the, and the children came to Sunday school. The son-in-law didn't. While, just as we finished Sunday school, he came in and said that this man had just died that, that morning. He was saved that night and died the next morning. Now, see, that, but that's the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit said, go talk to him. Go talk to him. Yes. Yeah, I'm on her knees. I'm on the tree and pray. 
But see, that's the leadership of the Holy Spirit. Paul wanted to go into Asia, and the Lord said no. Yeah, that's right. Now, here's what we're going to find out next week. Paul wanted to go into Asia, which he did later. You may have went to Ephesus, thousands of souls were saved, but not right now. He said, no, you're not going into Ephesus. I mean, you're not going into Asia. He wouldn't let him go the other direction, but he sent him into Europe. And he met a woman named Lydia. Lydia was having a little prayer meeting there by the river with just a few women. No men, just a few women. Now I want to tell you something. And boy, this is what really got me. Because of that few women, because Paul was obedient, he preached to those women. They got saved there in Europe. And do you realize that the people, primarily, I'll say 95% of the people that are saved in America the gospel came out of Europe. See, I'm from Europe. My ancestors are from Europe. Now, you stop and think about it. It goes all the way back to a few little faithful women sitting on a riverbank that believed the gospel. And then the gospel began to spread through Europe. And then Columbus or the pilgrims brought it over here. And we're saved today because Paul was obedient was to the Holy Spirit. Name, Hale, huh? Martin Hale. Yeah, well, he come right in here one time. I was sitting right over there, and I, I'd never seen him before. He said, "Do you want to invite home?" I said, "I said yes." He, he said, "Would you go down to the river in Spain next Wednesday night and preach?" And I said, "Joy Davis was there." Mm -hmm. I said, "If I had a way, he said, I'll take you down there." Well, he scared me to death. Oh, oh yeah. Where he drives. He had a Ford. He had a Ford. That's scary. Amen. One of them was an the ex-convict, and he got saved, joined that church, and I went back down, and he was a teaching in a reading class in a bus out there. Amen, amen. See, that's leadership of the Holy Spirit. Don't leave home without it. Don't think that you'll ever do the work of the ministry without the power and the leadership of the Holy Spirit. You just won't. I'll tell you what, organization is great. I have nothing against organization, but keep in mind, organization is just like the pipeline. It's not the fluid that flows through the pipeline. It's just the pipeline. But sometimes we get mistaken. We think, well, if I push this button and push this button, yeah, if we push all the right buttons, then this is going to happen. No, it doesn't. Not in God's work. Yes. That's right. That's right. You know, the problem with the church isn't that we don't have enough air conditioning or enough printing presses or advertising or television or radio. That's not it. The problem with the church today is that maybe we have too much of that. And we're not relying on the power of God that's, that's the and the leadership of the Holy Spirit. Uncle Mark, he was talking about my Uncle Mark. He told me something one time, and this is so true. I found this to be so true in my life. He said, did you ever try to pull a green apple off a tree? I said, well, I guess. I don't know. I don't know whether I ever did or not, but I can imagine. He said, you can pull and pull on that thing, and you'll nearly break that limb trying to get that green apple off that tree. But he said, if it's ripe, he said, you can just tap it and it fall right off your hand. And he said, that's the way it is winning souls. If you'll say, Lord, lead me to some soul today, it's like Clyde said, you'll find somebody crying under a sycamore tree saying, Lord, send help. Or you have a, a, a Macedonian vision that says, send help. Amen. It's not hard to win souls when the Lord does it. Now, you just keep that in mind. But it's impossible when you try to do it. And if you'll just say, Lord, lead me to those that are in need, those that are brokenhearted, those that are searching for you. And the only reason they're searching for you is because the Holy Spirit has put that burden on their heart. But they're out there, folks. We also they're need out. to remember the phrase that if I'm not the one to witness to them, that the Lord will send someone to witness to them. 
Yes, yes, because personality, see, or even location. Uh, because there might be somebody in Grove that, that Jimmy can, uh, has contact with that I don't. You see, Lord, pray, we pray we win souls and lead us or lead somebody. Lead. Anytime, but, anytime God's working on both ends, it'll happen. Yeah, that's right, but he's got to be working on both ends. Yes. It doesn't do any good to convict that guy if nobody tells him. He says, how shall they believe unless a preacher be sent? See, but at the same time, you can talk your head off, and if the Holy Spirit's not working on them, it's not going to do any good. Jerry, I just rejoice in that. We were sitting on line there in the emergency hospital, no, sir, in the medical center. There's a black man, a young black man, his wife sitting there, and I walked over and I said, Are you a Christian? He said, No. Will you say, No. My wife is. So, would you like to be? He said, Yes, sir. I said, You're going to be a little bit. Right there in that old emergency room, uh, all the people in there, we got out on our knees. He yeah. You know, I believe we'd probably be amazed if we knew how many people that would like to be saved but just don't know how. And they're not going to ask you because they think it's too complicated. Uh, this man one time was visiting and he went to an address and he knocked on the door and the people that he thought lived there was named like Smith or something and the lady come to the door and he said, uh, are you Miss Smith? She said, no. He said, is this a certain address? She said, yes, but I, my name is, and she told the name. So he thought, well, I'm already here. I'll just witness her. So he started witness to her a little bit. He said, she, and she said, let me tell you something. She said, I'm lost. And she said, all day I've just been praying, oh, God, send somebody to tell me how I can be saved. And there he went to the wrong place. No, he didn't. He went to the right place because of the Holy Spirit. See? That's the way it works, folks. But it only works if we do and if we're looking to God. Let's stand.